Thank you, Charles. So to clarify, I'm not the managing director of the whole of BT. That's Gavin Patterson's great privilege. Uh, I'm the MD of IT. So uh, we've been working in AI for about eight years now, seriously, about 20 years in, in terms of our research departments. And I, I agree with Charles that uh, something between the middle of the, the hype uh, that we see in the media and some of the real uh, use cases that are going to impact society are where we're going to land. Yeah, BT is a user, a developer, and a supplier of AI. So we have three uh, core roles in this space. But like many large companies, we've only really been deploying it in pockets and many parts of our organization that are still to really go through their digital transformation are still trying to grapple with what AI means for them. We're mostly making use of AI solutions that we've developed in-house through our research and development efforts, and we're only just starting to talk to other companies about the solutions uh, they're developing with a, with a sense of caution. Some of the areas we're using AI uh, are in the managing the schedules of our field engineers that come out and fix your, your faults and your homes and businesses. We're using it to detect and block nuisance calls, which I think we'd all agree is a really valuable use case. We're building propensity models for marketing, which some might argue is not quite as useful a use case. Um, we're detecting cybersecurity threats, protecting our government and our national infrastructure. And we're creating optimal network designs to build out our fibre and our 5G networks of the future. So some really powerful uh, use cases. And we do expect the use of AI to grow substantially over the next few years, but we're going to be very, very careful about where we deploy it. We need to really think through how we're going to govern and monitor the use of AI on a continuous basis. And that's because AI systems are fundamentally different to the IT systems we've been building for the last 30 years. The most recent boom in AI is caused by the bringing together of machine learning with the analysis of huge data sets. And where conventional software is written with a predetermined, defined set of rules and uh, decisions that are set in absolute stone, you know, AI systems learn to enhance and modify those rule sets and those decision bases from the patterns it sees in the data we feed it. That's a very different paradigm. And like human beings, AI systems can build biases, conscious biases in this case, and, uh, and jump to the wrong conclusions. Now, if we think about using data on our existing customers to inform what we should do with new customers, that's biased. Our customer data only has information about our customers, not the general population. If we think about using data on customers who are the heads of household, that might have some gender bias involved. If we think about data uh, on some of the more modern solutions that we sell, well, that might have a, an age bias within it. And you know, hopefully, if our world moves forward to a more inclusive future, our AI systems will only have been fed data about our past. So they'll include the biases that existed in our past, a very dangerous proposition. So as companies, we need to really carefully structure and organize our data, um, which is a really difficult task, because our data exists in a multitude of systems, usually disconnected and usually very poorly understood. The skills we're going to need to understand the linkages in those data and the assumptions that might be made by an AI solution probably don't exist in the general population today. Through media coverage, you know, I think customers will start to ask us questions about that. You know, what data are you holding about me? What decisions are you making about me and how are you making them? How are you training your AI systems to make these decisions on my life? And we as companies have better have a, a good set of answers uh, to those questions. I'm not sure we do uh, quite yet. We've also got to think about the impact on our employees. There are systems available now that can monitor your keystrokes, monitor your emails, and make assumptions about how productive you are, how, how you collaborate and network. I'm terrified because my typing is dreadful. Um, <laughs> But you know, in Europe, that's probably going to be illegal. Um, but in many parts of the world, it's not. And some of these solutions are already deployed in North and South America, for example. So our employees need comforting that whatever solutions we deploy are not aimed at them and that kind of oversight. One of the main objectives of AI is autonomous decisions. These decisions can lead to an action that's taken automatically, or they can be sent to a human being to review to then take an action. So decisions you know, can range from trivial ones like giving you a recommendation on your TV set box about a movie you might like. Not going to have a huge impact on you if it gets it wrong. But they can also um, now be uh, delivered in complex scenarios like making a decision from whether to give you a mortgage or a loan um, or give you a medical recommendation or schedule where you're going to be tomorrow as an engineer from a resource scheduling perspective. And those start to have significant human impact uh, if we get them wrong. 
So I think we also need to start having confidence about uh, the AI's decisions, recommendations and judgments. We should make them that those decisions are uh, really explainable and transparent. We should be really clear about when we're using AI in decision making and where we're not and how we're training our AI systems and what data we're using to do that. And today I don't think we're being that transparent uh, as organisations. We're also going to have to fundamentally change the way we develop software. We're going to have to build AI solutions, then train them using our data sets, but then we're going to have to monitor them as if they're a small child learning. Uh, we're going to have to monitor what decisions they're starting to make and what impact that might have on our customers and their outcomes. Um, it's, it, we don't have the skills today in one individual that would have that. We need people with deep technical knowledge, deep understanding of how decisions are being codified, and deep business process uh, knowledge as well. That's usually three or four people in our organisation today. Are our schools training that individual? No, they're not. One of the big hype topics is also around the automation of work. Um, this isn't new. You know, many uh, technology um, advancements have, have automated parts of our work. But I don't think that AI necessarily leads to automation of work. I think autonomous decisioning um, can then lead to a human or a, a people uh, interaction. If you imagine a doctor um, using an AI system to diagnose um, the treatment of, of cancer patients, well, that AI system can't then go on and treat that patient, but it can give the doctor more information and more insight um, on, on the diagnosis and the, uh, the predicted outcomes. So I think all organisations now have a duty to start thinking about where they deploy AI uh, and the ethics and governance frameworks they should be building around their use. All organisations should think about setting up a cross-team working party to build a governance and ethical framework for their organisation. You know, that framework should look at how we use customers' data, and we need to reassure them that we'll do more than what's legally required of us uh, in that space. We also need to uh, reassure our people, our employees, that we'll retrain them and we'll help AI augment what they do, not replace what they do. And we need to make sure that our AI systems make fair and unbiased decisions and that we're really transparent about the way they're doing that. So I think AI has massive potential. I think we have to be incredibly careful about the steps we take going forward. I think the ethical and governance frameworks we define over the next few years are going to be critical to, to the outcomes. Uh, and I think we've got a huge duty of care um, on the human side of this equation. You know, we need to help students, workers and citizens acquire the new skills and knowledge they need to safely, securely and effectively engage in an AI economy. Thank you. Rachel Hyam.